Thank you, John. Okay, um, let's take three questions and we'll see who there for you can, like we did before, you can address it specifically to someone or you can just raise your question and we'll see who wants to answer it. I'm right. sorry, I'm not sure it's a question. Okay. Um, I, I, uh, I, I very much appreciate the debate that's going on before us and um, if it's possible, I think I agree with both of you. Um, it's you lie. <laughs> 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 Just I think it's true that we have that we have goals uh, uh, that are principles and that are not in fact that are that are not flexible. The Constitution is the Constitution, and I also know I know as a legislator, and I guess I know in my life that um, there are pr plenty of practices that I know and accept that don't live by those principles. And um, I, I very much appreciate, Caleb, for you to put that brutally before us. I think that is part of what is the challenge of getting um, the laws we want passed uh, uh, really taken up. Um, that doesn't diminish uh, the inflexibility of our principles. Um, we need to hold ourselves to them and we need to push ourselves and our leaders uh, towards them. Um, and it's the real one. Okay, another question or comment, Dave? Just real quickly on going to the White House being fun. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, if we have a big crowd of people, we can block streets and they can't stop us and so forth. But the plan uh, for going to the White House on Monday is simply to exercise free speech. And the expectation of being arrested is of our right to use our, our, our freedom of speech in public being violated. Uh, and the idea that we can preserve speech, our right to free speech in any other way than by engaging in it and insisting on our right to use it, not just theoretically in a classroom, but by going out and exercising it where we expect it to be violated. Uh, I don't know any other way to accomplish that, whether it's fun or not. Uh, I think you have to do it. Um, somebody else. Yeah, John. Um, the authorizations of the use of military force, which were basically you know, what we're living under now, um, specifically precluded the implementation of the War Powers Act in their language when they were adopted in 01 and 03. And uh, Congress could have, and uh, we tried to push at different points when I worked up there, uh, for them to review the authorization because they certainly had the right to withdraw it. It's also the case that there's a, there's a standing bill that allows Congress in any 60-day period to review and reverse a state of emergency declared by a president, which has been in effect since uh, 2001, and Obama keeps signing it back into, uh, and that's authorizing a lot of excessive uh, kinds of decisions. Most wars, and I mean most, are covert. Yeah. Uh, and I, that's not been addressed, really. Completely right. outside the world. And, uh, or, or they're considered, like you said, since Korea, not war. Um, and so having a definition that's, that's more specific in terms of, uh, of war, I think, uh, is important. And an automatic way to review uh, authorizations of force uh, should, be, you know, should be built in. But um, Congress, to me, was like somebody who's given the uh, the car keys to the 15-year-old kid, and they're sitting there, he, he's smashing the door, he's wrecking the car, instead of taking the car keys back. And, um, you know, it, 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 but ultimately, if you have both Congress and the President wanting to do the thing, and Congress rubber stamping it, then it, it, it overcomes these constitutional questions because it's not being addressed. But. Um, you know, and, and then I, I think this idea, this question of the federalization uh, of all aspects, um, you know, it, it is, a, is important. Uh, that they can create these emergencies or extra constitutional powers under these various uh, matters. And that would include total militarization. Of, if you ever go to Red, Code Red, the, the, the highways become military, the phones become military, all communication becomes military. Um, you know, it, it, you're going into basically what they call continuity of government, where a few people sit in a bunker 
and determine what happens. And that was declared on 9-11 and not subsequently revoked as far as I know uh, because a month later the Post said shadow government operating in secret, big headline. I started to think I could, I could write for them then. But, um, you know, they, uh, they have a, a lot of extra constitutional powers built in to all of this when they want to go and they're not going to care about these niceties. But I do think that you're both right. When they're in public, they talk about the founders, and when they're in private, uh, you know, you don't want to watch. It's like what they say, like politics is like watching sausage being made. Uh, you don't want to see it. Um, I'm not sure there was a question. Okay. <coughs> yeah, um, John, I've written more of those statements and put them in members' speeches since about 1983 <laughs> than you can imagine. Uh, I put them in on, you know, the Foley Amendment on El Salvador to keep combat troops out of 84. But we never won because of it. You don't bring people over because of it. You bring people over because you get the speaker to offer the resolution. You bring it over because you got good citizen lobbying and you create a mood where you win it. I mean, you, know, you could talk Article One, Section 8, blah, 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 all day long. The numbers that count in Congress is 218 for the House, 60 for the Senate because you got to get rid of the stupid filibuster, uh, five for the Supreme Court, and to override a veto you need 66 and 290 in the House. Um, you know, the law gets redefined by what Congress is willing to do, and Congress is like a beast that responds to pressure. So this can all, as people have said, all change very easily. We've all seen it change in Vietnam and anti-apartheid and contra aid and all that. We, we do see it change with citizen pressure. But I don't think you bring people over by going back to the Constitution, much as I love to cite my father's own book, uh, Clinton Rossiter wrote the Supreme Court and the Commander-in-Chief probably in 1950, which has got everything in here. Although I think he did note that the Supreme Court always wins, but after the fact. They, they let the war end and yeah. he said you, you, you couldn't do that. Um, the CIA and its covert wars and the wars that are spurred and civil wars that we do with our arms transfers to support other governments are far more important than we've let on here today. And your point is well taken. Those are essentially uncontrolled. The system set up after the church committee in the mid-70s to control the CIA is an absolute shambles because you're not even allowed to talk about what you hear in the Intelligence Committee. If you want to talk to your boss about what you heard in the Intelligence Committee and you have a clearance, and the boss automatically has a clearance in Congress, you have to go to some secret room in the bowels of the Capitol so your the interference knocks away the electronics and they can't the Russians can't hear you. Nobody's going to take 20 minutes out of their day. And so what you're supposed to do, they say, well, just whisper to and, and you don't. So the whole intelligence thing is off the books. We foment a lot of wars on that. Uh, since the so-called Chada decision in 1983, for all your lawyers here, um, it's been a real mess trying to control arms transfers because now one house cannot block them as they used to in the old uh, Arms Transfers Act. There's a somewhat potent mechanism called reprogramming where committees during the year give money out in the appropriation, but as the conditions change, Presidents usually recognize a bit of their ability to massage the decisions of the Congress, but that's really a weak read to, to hold on to. Um, you know, the, the, the reason that the members of Congress who agree with the founders will not, in private, when they actually pull the vote, I guess that's not private, but when they actually pull the vote, support a strict interpretation of the war powers is, and I only found this out because I went to interview each of the powerful members of the House to try to get them on our bill. And I couldn't get many of them on our bill, which was the, the real Eagleton War Powers Bill, because they said, I won't go on that because I really wanted Clinton to be able to go into Kosovo. And if this had been the law of the land, we couldn't have done it, because the Republicans would never have approved Clinton to do anything. And then a Republican you talk to will say, the Democrats, in a partisan way, will never vote for Bush to do anything. So we can't really trust to let the Constitution work. It's so heavily politicized that members who want to be responsible, and that, despite what you've all said here today, that's most of the ones that I know, uh, they really want to make sure a president can do what they think is the right thing, and they don't, I mean, you cannot imagine, until you try to work there, the warfare between the Democrats and the Republicans. The Republican staff there think that we, Democratic staff, are the Antichrist. Period. There's no cooperation. There's no collaboration. If they can learn anything from you because you're trying to explain something, they will use it against you and they will leak it to the web and they will try to ruin your boss and it goes the other way too. So in this atmosphere, 
it's so heavily politicized that the only thing that moves them is citizen pressure back home. Unfortunately, not not lawsuits. I, I don't think. I have one. Can I quickly just answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just want to, and, and I'm sorry I have to go. I, you know, we're, we're like ships passing in the night here. We're talking past each other, Caleb and I. Caleb would have the panel be entitled War Powers in Practice before the U.S. Congress. But that's not the title of this panel. It actually deals with War Powers in Practice before the U.S. Courts as well. And believe me, as a lawyer who goes before courts, they care about arguments around what the founders said and interpretations of the Constitution. So I'm not going before Congress to testify and cite Jefferson and Madison and Hamilton. I'm going before courts. So in all deference, Caleb, to your point, my point is that we need to bring this matter before the third branch of government that has not heard enough of the resistance to this war. And that happened during the Vietnam War. There were, there were, repeated, there were repeated cases that were brought. And after a period of time, judges began to stand up. And that is the point I will leave you at, that as much as we should do what we can with Congress and, and with the Obama administration, we need to also engage the courts. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we'll Yes, no. My website says that the Iraq war is unconstitutional and illegal, both the Iraq and the war in occupation, the so-called war on terror, and I've got the, the uh, case law to prove it there, I believe. Am I wrong in making that statement? It is unconstitutional and illegal. I can, I can read a little bit of this. It's on my website. And I, I would make one of them. House Joint Resolution, the Joint Resolution of Authorized Force was obtained by fraud, it's been used to commit fraud, and it's unconstitutional and null and void. It's, it has no meaning. You can't uh, lie and get a law passed and then go in and enforce that law. And as a Naval Academy graduate, we were taught the first day, don't obey illegal orders. Excuse me, yes or no? Am I wrong? You're right. I'm right, okay? I'm right, but irrelevant to the Congress. <laughs> If it's a fair probate money for it, there's many it's not irrelevant to us. It's not irrelevant to you? It's not irrelevant to us. So if you appropriate money for it, is it legal? Yeah, I would say your, your description of the 2001 and 2002 resolutions as being without force now is essentially correct. I, I, I would agree with you. I say it's been never had force. No and void. You can't obtain something by fraud and use it. Well, let me throw one back that's a little bit, a little bit different. I was at the Pentagon a few weeks ago and bring up this exact same issue. And the well-meaning people at the Pentagon who are trying to figure out for Obama what to do in Afghanistan, but he's told them, of course, he wants to go in, so they've got to figure out something to do, right? said, well, you're right, we really don't have the authority to be there, and uh, the war's not going well, and the resolution didn't have anything to do with keeping the Taliban out of power, the 2001 resolution. Right. But how can you desert the women of Afghanistan? Uh. <laughs> so I said, well, I said, I said, and this comes back to your thing, if you want to go to war to defend the rights of the women of Afghanistan and send U.S. troops to die and to kill and destroy Afghanistan to do that, then you better come back to Congress, because if you look at that 2001 resolution, there ain't a lot in there about that.